This video contains spoilers for The Rise of Skywalker. If you've watched literally any video on my channel before, you probably have a good understanding of my opinion towards Star Wars Episode 8, The Last Jedi. I don't like it. You're not alone, Shafe. I don't mean to beat a dead horse, I know I'm late to the party, but The Last Jedi was an absolute travesty of filmmaking, and a quite thorough character assassination of Luke Skywalker. I hadn't really been a fan of Star Wars until the sequel trilogy came along, and even then I hadn't watched the original trilogy until just a few months ago. But going back and looking at TLJ after watching the OT, I can confidently say, fuck that movie. On the other hand, you know the Avengers? Now I like the Avengers. I don't know if you could tell that from my previous videos, but yeah. I like it too. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is generation-defining, a true feat of storytelling, at least for mainstream television and film. Sure, comic books with massive stories have been going for decades, and Warhammer 40k is almost 40 years old now. But, though I can't speak for Warhammer, I know that both Marvel and DC Comics are mired with inconsistencies. Even when there's an in-universe explanation for them, they still manage to fuck themselves up. In more than 20 films, the biggest fuck-up that the MCU has is introducing time travel, and that's new. No, not all of them were gems, some of them were downright awful. But most of them were at least fun to watch, with the Guardians franchise remaining damn near flawless. Don't fuck it up now, James Gunn. So knowing these two things, I bet you took a look at that thumbnail and said, HA! Shafe, you idiot, you mixed up the symbols on the thumbnail! It's supposed to be Last Jedi bad, and game good! Eh, not quite. When I saw this in my recommended, I am sub to you, I was initially skeptical, but as with all things that I immediately disagree with, I try to make an effort to hear people out. I try to acknowledge when I have a bias, and not necessarily correct it, because some don't need correcting, but I do try to at the very least hear non-strawman representations of the opposition. So, I did go into this video knowing full well what you meant by the thumbnail, and I wanted to hear your argument for why you seem to think that Luke was done better than Thor. Because as it stands, though I find both of them more poorly handled, at least Thor was just mistreated, not torn apart and stitched back together with half of his organs missing. And to that I say, oh ho ho ho, prepare to get your expectations subverted so hard. Also spoilers. Endgame is a really good finale and a great send off for Tony Stark and Steve Rogers. But today, I'd like to talk about the most divisive character in the movie. The person who split audiences on whether or not they treated the character with any dignity or respect. This character, of course, is Call Obsidian. People weren't too happy when Ant-Man stepped on him and completely disposed of him in such an embarrassing manner. But personally, I think it's a step up from the last movie where Bruce Banner sent him flying into the Gungan force field. So honestly, I'm okay with Call Obsidian's role in this movie. It's a cool death, so why not? Back in the 90s, I was in a very thing Just a personal opinion, but that joke was way too long. Huh. That took a lot less time than I expected. I guess while I'm here, I can talk about the second most divisive character in the movie. Thor has had a rough time in these past few films. After losing everyone he loves, getting his chance to avenge them, and completely blowing it, I don't blame him for falling into an alcoholic stupor and drowning his sorrows by playing Fortnite with Korg. That's probably what I would do if I were him, minus the Fortnite. I will play literally any other game with Korg, but a reality where people still play Fortnite in 2023 is scarier than any Thanos. See, that joke was way better, and not all that intrusive. Jokes aside, though, I definitely agree that Thor's reaction to being the one responsible for half the universe's lives just ceasing to exist, all because he decided to gloat instead of just taking out the purple fuckhead, is 100% in character. Speaking of Thanos, I think the scene where Thor has a breakdown at the mere mention of Thanos' name is fantastic. It's kind of haunting, actually, just how broken he's become, and how much he tries to mask his fears. It's some tremendous acting from Hemsworth. I really liked Thor in this movie on my first viewing. He reminded me of Peter B. Parker in a lot of ways, from being chunky due to emotional stress, to meeting an alternate timeline version of his deceased maternal figure, to... What else? Just those two things. Just those two things! But yeah, Thor was tragic and understandable, and aside from the offhand snide comment here and there about his physique, I didn't think they really played him for laughs that often. I'm not sure I agree with you there. I'm going to say something fairly controversial, but there are some things that shouldn't be made fun of. Specifically, you shouldn't be making fun of things that people have little to no control over. Thor is fat because he's depressed, and when the characters make fun of his fatness, which is another discussion unto itself, they are, by proxy, making fun of his depression. 
One might argue that the characters are only making fun of Thor's fatness and don't even know about his depression, which I'd still argue isn't okay, but even if that were the case, it doesn't matter because the script does know about Thor's depression. Moreover, the script wants the audience to laugh at these jokes. Despite laughing at and finding some of the jokes funny, I know I'm not alone when I say that I was made at least a little uncomfortable by them. I, in particular, was made uncomfortable by these jokes because I come from a family with a strong predisposition to mental illness and understand the effect that it has on people. Thor in this film is clearly an example of someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, and while I am not very familiar with PTSD, I am intimately familiar with depression from having lived with those affected by it almost my entire life. Please note that I'm not trying to say that anybody is a bad person for laughing at these jokes or even finding them funny, as I myself did at first. But you need to acknowledge that despite that, the jokes still weren't okay to make. Sure, one might take a look at Fat Thor and think it's kind of funny, but that doesn't make it okay to laugh and poke fun at it, particularly when there's a clear and easy to understand cause as presented with Thor in this film. What the movie should have done is truly take a look at the character and ask, how have the mistakes Thor has made affected him? Instead, they just said, Thor fucked up so he let himself go. And look, Thor's fat now. Haha. <laughs> That's incredibly disrespectful to both Thor as a character and the people in the audience who may have had to deal with similar mistakes in their own lives that did lead to self-loathing, because it shows that their depression is something to be laughed at. Some might argue that it's okay that Thor is the subject of so much ridicule in the film, because he's partially responsible for the snap that ended half of all sapient life in the universe. But it's a lot more nuanced than that. If you want to ridicule Thor because of his actions, ridicule his actions, and not his more than reasonable, valid response to that. That is the crux of my argument here, really. When you make fun of something, you are saying, in part, that it's ridiculous, stupid, or something that should be mocked. When they joke about Thor in the way that they do in the film, they are saying that Thor is a joke. They are saying that his depression is a joke, and it's used as little more than fodder for cheap shots about Cheese Whiz and the Big Lebowski. It's not okay, and given the way that Thor's treatment has been received by most of the public, I hope that the Russos learn how to properly handle such issues in the future. Anyway, despite my overall response to its handling of Thor as a character, this is far from the biggest problem I have with this movie. Let's move on. I thought his story arc was really nice. Then I thought about it, and I realized... Wait a minute. There's no payoff. Thor never has a heroic moment that redeems his failure in the previous movie. I'm just inserting this here to let you know that for the next couple minutes, he says a lot of stuff that I mostly agree with. If you want to skip ahead to the part where we disagree and I start talking again, skip to this timestamp. He was regarded by the Russos as the would-be main hero of Infinity War if he had stopped the snap. And he didn't and killing Thanos after the fact didn't redeem this failure either. Thor is drowning in failure throughout all of Endgame, but there's no sacrifice or dramatic confrontation that pays off any of the self-pity that we see in this movie. He never has a moment that solidifies himself as a true hero, which is weird when you consider that literally every other core Avenger has a moment like that. Hawkeye volunteers to be the one to test the dangerous time travel, Black Widow sacrifices herself for the Soul Stone, Hulk wields the gauntlet and brings everybody back, potentially losing his arm in the process, Cap proves himself worthy enough to wield hammer, and Tony Stark, uh, I don't know, can you guys think of any sacrifices or heroic moments Tony had? I'm drawing a blank. Thor is the only one who doesn't get one of these moments, and the weird thing is, he did have a moment like this in Infinity War with the whole taking the force of a star thing, but it had a lot less impact since Thor's failures at that point in the story were much less massive, and because it happened while cutting back and forth with an extensive battle, meaning the pacing didn't allow for the same impact where his near sacrifice could really sink in. Giving Thor one of these moments in Endgame, or at the very least, a verbal confrontation with Thanos where he affirms that he's not afraid of Thanos despite his failure, would have been all I needed. All he says is, let's kill him properly this time. Yeah, okay, great, but this confrontation with the only guy you ever failed to defeat should have way more weight. It just feels like Thor is fighting him just cause that's what the original three Avengers gotta do. Not because of his own personal vendetta against Thanos, that feels largely neglected here. I know Thanos almost sliced Thor open with his own axe at one point, but there was no interplay between those characters, so the fact that it was Thor really didn't make a difference. I mean, the Scarlet Witch confrontation was great, exactly what I would have hoped for after what happened last movie. Why didn't Thor get a moment like this? Why didn't he get any sort of dramatic beat or sacrifice play during the final battle? He's one of the core Avengers 
Avengers in their final movie together, and he was the main hero in the last movie. It literally started and ended with his confrontations with Thanos. Why does he feel like an afterthought in this movie? On top of that, Thor in Endgame did have his scenes that were played for laughs. He did have his Dark Elves woo scene, and your Lebowski jokes, and Cheese Whiz, and so on and so forth which I'd still argue weren't okay. He also seems really easy to encourage to join the fight. Like, too easy considering he has the dust of half the universe on his hands. He joins the time travel mission because beer. He talks to his mommy for like four minutes and bada boom, he's back to his old self. I wouldn't say that. Sure, she set him on the right path and being able to summon Mjolnir sure helped, but he's still got quite the journey ahead of him and I hope they do treat it with respect in either Love and Thunder, Guardians Volume 3, or both. For how realistically his grief was set up, it's resolved really quickly and without any real weight. Again, that isn't the case. He was started on the right path, and he was set up to have a greater arc of recovery over the next few films involving him. I know there's a lot of plot lines and character arcs to fit in, but the movie is three hours long. You could have found time to develop one of your main three characters more. I agree, but it seems like what you want is for him to still be resolved by the end of the film like you seem to think has been done here just with more scenes explaining it. First, that's not what the film's done here, and second, no. Depression isn't something that a single conversation or even a handful of conversations can remedy. It's a long process, and despite the tirade I just went on, it's one of the few things I think the movie does well. It doesn't try to make it out like Thor is just all better now. That's why Thor decides not to be king anymore, instead essentially going on a journey to find himself and hopefully mostly recover, if not completely. Just cut the scene where Ant-Man eats a taco. Actually, I take that back. This is one of my favorite scenes. I'm sorry I dissed it. But the more I thought about Thor in this movie and the kind of beats that would make his story arc better, I came to an unfortunate realization. Thor in this movie is just a less developed, worse version of Luke in Last Jedi. Yes, really. Please explain. Two legendary heroes broken by failures that left their worlds in ruins. They retreat to some place close to the sea and drink their problems away. Then later, they become heroes yet again. But the main difference, aside from the fact that Luke is mostly treated with dignity, No he's not. Mostly. Is the fact that Luke's arc throughout the movie is actually focused on and followed through on. No it's not. Ray just tells him that he's wrong about who failed who, and then boom, he's helping the heroes again. A good chunk of the movie, and when I say a good chunk, I mean the only good chunk. The only good parts of this movie are Leia's message from episode 4, and Rey being fascinated by Rain because she's from a desert planet. Is the stuff with him, Rey, and Kylo. While he teaches Rey things about the Force, she helps him come to grips with his own failures. And it really takes a while for him to process and recover from said failures. No, again, all she did was say, You didn't fail Kylo, Kylo failed you. I won't fail you. And then boom, he's all better. No, that's not how that shit works. You talk about how you were upset about how Thor was handled because only one conversation is what it took to help them, but that's what fucking happened here! Endgame, it's not even strictly implied that Thor is all better, but in this movie, they fucking outright say it! Thor is fine after one conversation with his mother. No, he fucking isn't! Luke, meanwhile, is constantly drowning in his grief. So was Thor! He spent the last five years drinking and playing video games! He only agrees to train Rey after careful contemplation and talking to R2 in a really beautiful scene that doesn't feel like cheap fan service at all. It's a touchy moment. Whether or not you felt like it was cheap fan service is irrelevant. It was cheap fan service. It was touching, and one of the few moments that made even a little bit of sense in the movie, but it was still cheap fan service. He second guesses himself over and over about whether or not he should be training Rey, and rejoining the fight? Forget it, he's immovable. Except for the part where he does end up helping out. And don't give me that it was just a force projection bullshit. He helped by distracting them. Regardless of how stupid the plan was, it worked. The movie makes you feel that. He literally says he came to this island to die, which is heartbreaking. You're right, it is heartbreaking. He's also not the character we were left with at the end of episode 6. I have no issue with the fact that Luke is like this. The problem is that he is so different from what we had previously understood his character to be that it requires explanation. An explanation that we don't see. His dad was Space Hitler, but despite that, Luke still thought he deserved saving. Ben hadn't even done anything! He was having bad dreams! I have fucked up dreams every now and then. Everyone does! And sure, Luke didn't try to kill Ben, but he got as far as igniting his goddamn lightsaber when he only got that far in episode 6 after several minutes of goading and watching his friends die. All Ben did was have a dream. 
Luke was not this person in episode 6, so we need to see an explanation for why he was that way in the flashback. Thor agrees to join the mission because there's booze on the ship. The moment when he rejoins the fight is played off as a joke. Luke rejoins the fight after he's talked some sense into by none other than Yoda. Okay, in the same way that this Luke ain't fucking Luke, that Yoda ain't fucking Yoda. Yoda stopped pretending to be a bumbling dumbass after Luke knew who he was, and the prequels portray Yoda as quite dignified. And don't tell me, oh, so he wants to be like the prequels now. Fuck off. The prequels, while quite awful, weren't as bad as people make them out to be, and regardless, Disney said that they're canon, so writing Yoda as this fucking joke is inconsistent and disrespectful. And don't even get me started on greatest teacher failure is. Another great scene, in spite of how bad that puppet is, I'm still not over that. Oh, it's disgusting! No, you! And by the way, Luke rejoining the fight as a hologram instead of in person? First of all, his whole ship is underwater! I think most of us know how well that aged. Second, it's perfectly reasonable considering the grief he's experienced. Whether he's physically there or not, he's still confronting the source of his grief in Kylo. Unlike Thor and Thanos, the entire climax of this movie revolves around the confrontation between the two characters who incited this devastation. The villain who tore everything down and the hero who failed to stop them. Actually, no, they aren't. In the movie, Luke says that Snoke got to him first. If anything, the fight should be between Luke and Snoke, not Luke and Kylo. And technically Endgame doesn't qualify here because this Thanos isn't the same one who killed half the universe. So that's a limitation on Endgame's part, and a topic for another day. The Last Jedi, meanwhile, features an emotional confrontation where Luke finally redeems his failure and saves everyone. Failure is the greatest teacher, as Yoda said. Yoda only said it because Ryan Johnson thinks that his audience is a bunch of fucking morons who don't understand themes unless it's literally told to them. Also, the only failure anybody learns from is this one right here. Some try to argue that Rey failed to convert Kylo, but that's not a failure on her part. Again, she didn't fail Kylo, Kylo failed her. And this final showdown ties into the theme of the movie beautifully. It's also beautiful to see Luke speaking hopefully about the future during this confrontation, when he was in such a dark place the whole movie. A dark place that we don't have an explanation for. His death scene is really powerful. It's not pointless, shut up. That's like saying Obi-Wan's death scene is pointless. Watch a movie for its themes and subtleties for once instead of taking everything at face value. The reason Obi-Wan's death wasn't pointless is because he believed that letting Darth Vader kill him would motivate Luke to kill Vader. Luke died for meta reasons. I'm fairly certain that Disney was trying to get rid of as many OT characters as they possibly could and only kept the ones that they could easily merchandise. Luke's death doesn't actually make sense contextually. Unless I'm mistaken, nobody in canon has died from too much force. I think the only reason Luke came as a hologram is because Disney told Ryan, you have to kill Luke. But Ryan really wanted Luke to have his whole not Hoth fight with Kylo for some reason, but also have him die with a dual sunset. And as for watching a movie for its themes, if the only indication to what your film's theme is, is a character literally telling me like I'm a three-year-old watching Dora the Explorer, and one example where the theme is applicable, then the movie fails on delivering on that theme, and it should be docked several points. Stop complaining that Old Man Cap makes no sense, it's beautiful. I like Old Man Cap and agree that it's beautiful, but fuck off. It doesn't make sense. I appreciate it thematically, but it breaks the world and impacts the film on an objective level. The Russos wanted to have Old Man Cap because they knew audiences would appreciate it, despite it breaking the established time travel rules and having an impact on the objective quality of the film. I'll say again, I like Old Man Cap, but that doesn't change that it fucks up the movie. Speaking of which, that's the final nail in the coffin for Thor. He has no endgame in this movie. It really feels like they didn't know what to do with him at the end compared to the masterful endings Tony and Steve got. This doesn't need to be the end for Thor, and the fact that it isn't isn't a knock against the film. As I mentioned, I think it's appropriate that things aren't patched up by the end of the movie. I'd also like to point out that Tony and Steve really were the main characters of the Avengers movies. Thor and Hulk were never really given much attention in either of the first two, except for the stuff with Nat and Banner, which went absolutely nowhere. But because Tony and Steve really were the focus of the Avengers franchise for most of the films, the fact that they got their ending makes sense. It wouldn't have made much sense to do the same for Thor because he hasn't had the same focus. Also, Ragnarok essentially undid what was done in the first two films because of the soft reset. In the grand scheme of things, Thanos was just a minor slip-up in the middle of his story, and pretty soon he'll be back to his full comedic self again now that he's joining the Guardians. What? A minor slip-up? 
Just because everyone was brought back doesn't change the fact that half of the universe was dead for five years and he lived with that for five years. Stuff like that doesn't just go away. But Luke, his arc is complete. His story in Last Jedi has a sense of finality to it because the heroic moment during the climax belonged to him. He redeemed his failure in a story that focused on his redemption. A redemption for a failure that wasn't explained. For redemption to work properly, we need to know why the person fucked up in the first place and then watch them realize why their response, no matter how big or small, was inappropriate. The biggest explanation we get for Luke is it was a moment of weakness, and his redemption is Rey telling him it's not your fault. I'm sorry, somebody as far gone as Luke in this context ain't going to be fine after one conversation. Let's take a moment to pretend that Luke's attempted assassination of his nephew has been set up and actually does make sense. He's been on that island sulking for more than 10 years, a little less than 14, and he's had a lot of time to think about what's happened, and Ray simply walking up to him and saying, it's not your fault, isn't going to affect him nearly as much as it does in the film. As much as I rag on Endgame for its poor handling of Thor's trauma, TLJ, while not treating it as a joke, arguably handles it even worse, actually treating it like something that can be fixed after one conversation. Luke dealt with the trauma of his nephew killing all of his students and having believed that he failed his nephew as both an uncle and a teacher for more than twice as long as Thor, a literal god who had to deal with the death of half of all life being on his hands. Yet he's over it in a couple of days after talking to Ray Palpatine over here. As for a sense of finality, we already had that in Return of the Jedi. This movie is the one that fucked his character and tried to claim victory as it failed to put it back together again. Endgame, on the other hand, had to follow up on the question of Thor's reaction to his actions in Infinity War. And there's not a sense of finality to his redemption because his story isn't finished. I'm going to talk about Avatar The Last Airbender for a moment here because it is one of the most beloved and arguably most well-done redemption arcs ever written. For the first two and a half seasons of the show, Zuko spends his time hunting Aang, the Avatar, because he wants to regain his honor and he believes it can only be restored by his father. During the second season, we start to see Zuko change, but we don't see him fully commit and switch sides until midway through the final season, including his realization that his abusive dad's perception of honor doesn't fucking matter. However, even with his development up until the point of switching sides, his redemption isn't finished. He still needs to earn the trust of Team Avatar, and most of the remaining show is focused on just that. Zuko helps them and tries to show how he's changed. He learns some valuable lessons from the team, and they learn a lesson or two from him as well. Just because he switched sides and arguably fixed the problems that he's caused doesn't mean his arc is complete. Just because the dead that Thor is responsible for aren't dead anymore doesn't mean his arc is finished. The sense of finality that you speak of isn't always necessary because it doesn't always fit and needs to be saved for later. Even if this redemption for Luke worked, I'd argue that it isn't done and needed to be explored more in The Rise of Skywalker. Thor was a side character thrown into Endgame to make fat jokes and kinda redeem later on, but with no real dramatic weight attached to his journey. It feels juvenile, while Luke's story feels mature and poetic. Just because it feels poetic doesn't mean it is. Thor is also not the focus when he could have gotten equal focus to Tony and Steve. I know that's not the case since we'll see more of him. That's precisely why that's the case. Sure, he could have used more focus, but he didn't need the same level of focus that Tony and Steve got because this isn't the end of his story and it is the end of theirs. But again, dealing with the repercussions of Thanos was kind of a major thing for his character. But... I guess it really wasn't in the grand scheme of things. Now look, I really hate Last Jedi. I'd probably rather rewatch Attack of the Clones since it's at least way funnier and meme filled. What would what, he do? Jump out of a moving vehicle? If you'll excuse me. But Last Jedi is not the worst movie ever made, and I have to give credit where I see it. This ain't it, Chief. Luke's emotional journey was really compelling. Thor's could have been, but it fell short. Sometimes it's important to let go of our hate and recognize when a bad movie does something better than a good movie. Again, this ain't it, Chief. There you go. I brought balance to the Force by talking positively about The Last Jedi for a change. Perfectly balanced. Now that I've said both good and bad things about it, I'm sure the comment section will be perfectly content. You know, at least I tried. Well, that happened.
As for having tried, I believe that you tried. I think you tried too hard. I believe that you were so desperate to appease the people who liked this movie that you tried to find something that was done right about it, or at least done better than a better movie, that you saw something that wasn't there. This situation is similar to the last video that I made, and I want to tell people that Schaeferless doesn't often make content this bad, and I enjoy most of the stuff that he puts out, even finding most of it good. I suggest that anybody watching this check out his channel. I suggest his video about Shrek 2 and why it's a perfect sequel. And please, anybody who's a fan or is Shafe himself, please don't take this personally. I'm simply criticizing your work, and I do believe that you're a decent guy. Now time for the YouTube stuff. If you like the video, please show it. If you dislike the video, please show it. If you have anything to say regarding this specific video, please say so in the provided section, as it reflects positively to the YouTube algorithm and will allow me to have a wider reach. I also post my content on BitChute and Library, and suggest you follow me on those other platforms because YouTube has a monopoly and I think that should be changed. Thank you for watching, and hope to see you next time.